Daedalus here. You're probably wondering why I would even bother to look into this. It is fairly well known by now that the YouTube channel run by What If Altist produces right-wing fantasy disguised as historical and philosophical content. It's bad. Almost laughably so. My struggle in making this video was from a product of my own desire not to come down too hard on a clearly uneducated young man who is currently scaling the heights of the Dunning-Kruger curve. There remains a chance that he could come to see these videos with the same level of embarrassment that many others in the community do. However, he also retains a fairly large audience, and with that comes in my mind at least a responsibility to be as rigorous as possible in your presentation. In deciding if this video was a very slick propaganda or simply wrong, I've spent some time reviewing portions of the library of his work in order to try to get a sense of where it might have gone wrong. The scope What If Altist has achieved in coverage is only possible due to the vapid and shallow nature of the content. Often no examples are provided for claims at all or are just simply wrong or just tautologies. The particular video at issue is, Who Will Win America's Next Civil War? I culled through the approximately 30 minute video cutting out the most egregiously fantastical bits to elaborate on. For the sake of fairness and to allow watchers to more easily contextualize both What If Altist's video and the larger discussion, I shall include a link to the original video in the doobly-doo down below. In addition, I will create a pinned comment with the sources where I looked into some of the more dubious claims. The question asked here matters. In conversations, friends and acquaintances have often remarked on America's polarization and the possibility of violence breaking out. It should be explored better than what has been done by What If Altist. In this part, we will examine some of the flaws present in this video. In the following parts, we will establish the causes and circumstances of the American Civil War in order to assess what kind, if any, violence is occurring in the present day. Without further ado, in what if Altist's own words, This is a video to make an honest and brutal look at how another American Civil War would break out. In order to get a sense of bearing for any conflict, it is important to establish what factions exist and what those factions choose to stand for. Luckily, what if Altis does this? Unfortunately, these turn out to be mythical conceptions of right-wingers and leftists. This is a problem. It rather fatally undermines the integrity of any following analysis. The right and left are stuck onto a chart, which suggests that each group values radically different ideals things where we're at the point where conservatives and progressives talk, dress, worship, teach, eat, love, and literally about everything else differently. Let's spend some time here on this chart and discuss a couple of aspects of it. Any analysis one makes of conditions should be built upon a bulwark of data. This chart is incredibly generic, and at no point does our intrepid hero ever make any attempt to suggest that his chart may even be slightly oversimplified. It is indicative of larger flaws in what if altist methodology, such as you might call it. The topics covered in this chart are too cross-disciplinary and too complex to be boiled down to a pair of sentences apiece. Suggesting particular styles of dress and diet match onto particular political positions requires data, lots of it, and there simply isn't any here. The religion section is particularly vexing. What is traditional religion? The contrast is nearly impossible to draw beyond a set of loaded terms. I'd also struggle to name any particular theology which solely seeks spiritual fulfillment through the advancing of causes for oppressed groups in the public sphere. This is a breathtakingly huge generalization. I could see tenuous connections to concepts like a church making a public display of accepting a group that is marginalized, but to call this a form of worship is to severely abuse the term. Worship is how one shows fealty and reverence to the chosen gods or goddesses. Depending on how a particular faith sees the relationship between a god and people, it could lead followers to conclude that they should be more accepting and kind. But we've also seen examples of this going the other way as well. Sexual expression and love do not map neatly onto a simplified political spectrum. However, before diving into this topic, I just want to note that apparently consent is only important to leftists in what if altists' worldview, and since you almost certainly not claim to be a leftist, I would suggest potential partners of the man should perhaps take this into consideration and exercise some caution around him. This topic is probably the easiest part of this chart to talk about in a limited amount of time. A great deal of ink has been expended on the topic, and while it can be difficult to always get forthright and honest answers from people about their sex lives, many attempts have been made to investigate this. I've attached some articles and a pinned comment for the viewer to read, and for the sake of the terms of service, we won't get too much in details here. But suffice to say, this chart is wrong. 
When you look at the data, time and time again, conservatives report being highly satisfied with their sex lives and on the whole report interest in things that are commonly defined as kinky sex or the consumption of pornography. This is a fascinating and massive topic all in its own, and it's well beyond our scope here. But suffice to say, what if Altis does not nearly have as effective grasp on sexual politics as he might imagine? The art section is also far too simple. Art history is a massive topic, and we see the word traditional again. And I'm once again forced to ask, what is traditional? Traditional is a loaded word and incredibly context specific. Its use here is more evocative than descriptive. Finally, I would hasten to point out that teachers of any political persuasion would find both the supposed functions that have been described here as important in the instruction of students. I suspect we have spent more time doing a cursory examination of this chart than was put into its creation. I will include a link to a video playlist by Ian Dance at his excellent YouTube channel Innuendo Studios in which he looks into the methods of the alt-right and also highlights some of the different ways that conservatives and progressives see the world. Next, What If Altist takes us on an abbreviated tour of the country. He uses loaded language to describe his observations, and this is a typical display of his contempt up for his straw man of the left. Countless signs telling you'll define God that abortion is wrong. Likewise, I'm in Los Angeles right now, and I briefly lived in New York, and in both places, you will see overtly left-wing signs and billboards in the street. When people tell me social justice isn't a real movement, I just point to how Times Square had a giant billboard about encouraging Latinx stories from Disney. The craziest place I've ever been to in America was Portland, Maine, where it seems like a majority of shops had some kind of social justice virtue signaling messages. Eventually we come to a fairly incredible question which seems to suggest a certain ignorance of conditions on what if autists part. We're in a modern civilized country. Will we really degrade towards killing our own people with guns, missiles, and axes? And has anything like this happened before? The short answer is yes. At the time of recording this video, CNN reports 36 mass shootings in the past three weeks. Violence is a somewhat difficult thing to properly track in the United States. We lack a unified requirement for reporting it, and therefore we have a very patchwork understanding of violence. We also live in a media environment that accentuates some forms of violence in certain areas in order to score political points. The United States consistently has some of the highest levels of gun violence in the world. Already, we are ranked second for the year. For the small arms survey of 2018, there are over 1 billion small arms in circulation all over the world, with an approximate 857 million in the hands of civilians. Of these, approximately 393 million are owned by citizens of the United States. By contrast, all the militaries of the world have around 133 million small arms, and law enforcement has somewhere around 23 million small arms. Simply put, there are an awful lot of small arms owned by American citizens. Consequently, there's an awful lot of gun violence experienced by American citizens. The question of whether this becomes organized violence is much more complicated. On a follow-up video, we will discuss the methods and modes of political violence as it is currently and likely to continue to happen in the United States. Moving along, we come to another claim that possibly provides some insight into what a fault his worldview. The Americans of today who want to destroy white men from curriculums are descendants of the men who fought in the beaches of Normandy within living memory. However, Rarely do you hear one claim that there are groups that want to destroy white men when that someone themselves is not a white supremacist. This is not to say that these are the views of what a faultist, but he makes a number of statements across his videos that are suggestive of such views. We are not told who what a faultist thinks these supposed destroyers of white America are. We are also not told who the white men under supposed attack are. Historically, who has been included in the umbrella of white has been a contingent upon the times. For example, the second iteration of the KKK, founded in 1915, started the group's tradition of nativist thought and added groups for their target list, such as Catholic and Jewish Americans. The earlier iterations had simply limited itself to targeting African Americans and their supporters. On the one hand, these observations cry out for elaboration. On the other hand, it may be that this is just a dog whistle, and that's why the details are so light. This will be important in part two of this video.
However, the way our society is set up incentivizes Americans to hate each other. In order to understand how America could have a civil war, we have to see the incentives of what pushes Americans to feel desperate enough to turn on their own people. The answer I'm going to give is that Americans today live poor and sad lives, which makes them feel the need to turn to violence for any hope of changing anything. Well, that certainly is a claim. Of course, it isn't substantiated, it is incredibly broad. At my most generous, I would suggest that what a faultist is driving at the Marxist concept of alienation. But expecting him to be conversant with the concept at any meaningful level is probably a little too generous on my end. And the America of today has serious problems. As I've said more clearly in this video, normal Americans have seen their standards of living decline precipitously over the last 50 years as wages have stayed the same while the cost of living has gone up. Just look at The Simpsons or stuff like John Hughes movies, where working class characters have multiple children, own their homes, and go on vacation as norms in the 1980s, which is unimaginable today even for young upper middle class people. As I've described in these videos as well, the collapses in social communities and amounts of sex among Americans create a restless, angry, and crazy population. Humans are by nature sexual and social beings. Once you remove the ability to have children, which almost no young people can afford today, enter relationships or have balanced social communities, societies lose their way and descend into barbarism and tribalism. These factors are most heavily concentrated among young men, which are the demographic you least want to piss off. In many ways, the fate of a country depends on how it treats its young men, who with their boundless testosterone and energy push forwards in any direction they can. An excess of young men must either push outwards as a team or else start to kill itself. The reason most societies marry couples off at age 15 and arrange marriages is to make sure young men become sexually satisfied and stakeholders in society as fast as possible, at the cost of the society's creativity and social mobility. Due to how dating apps work, young men today are having less sex, they make less money than young women, they are told by feminism that their masculinity is toxic, and they are shown no options by society either towards manliness and honor or a place in society. This last clip is something else. Here we are told that bored, sexually frustrated young men are the chief antagonists who will start fighting if they are not properly occupied or provided sex. Feminism and dating apps are blamed for men's declining satisfaction in their lives. This is a pretty typical right-wing grift, which infantilizes young men and reduces women to mere objects. Feminism is a deep, complex topic with a considerable number of thinkers promulgating a number of strands of thought that, broadly speaking, all seek to end sexism and achieve gender equality under the law. Some feminists suggest that some modes of masculine expression are harmful or toxic, but I know a few who would suggest that all modes of masculine expression are toxic. There are good videos that go into this topic better, some quite recently due to a surge of interest in the topic after Andrew Tate was arrested. I'll link videos from ContraPoints, President Sunday, and Zena and Poppy, who cover these topics extensively. These are all very long discussions, but they're all excellent analysis. This is my absolute favorite part of this video. Even an Ivy League degree in most cases will lead to a life of soul-crushing corporate work. In all honesty, out of my personal experience, the only people who have good careers today are those who are self-employed like CEOs, freelancers, or influencers, since they aren't part of the problem of labor being so cheap today. What if Altist's personal experience is that he's a 21-year-old kid? I remember being in my early 20s and thinking I had everything figured out. I did not. One simply doesn't have much of a basis to claim expertise based on experience in the early 20s. You certainly might think you do, but then your late 20s and your early 30s comes and they turn out to be kind of harsh teachers. I suspect my rapidly approaching late 30s will be much the same. The point is, if we allow ourselves to, we have opportunities to grow as we get older. Curiously, this clip seems to arrive at a conclusion that most people aren't happy at the present system. Which is where I got the hint of the concept of alienation from, but as I said, that seems generous. Today, when you boil it down, as I explain in this text wall, exists to benefit the college educated and to establish agendas that fit their worldview and self-interest. You can see this in how they're planning on forgiving student debt. The right, meanwhile, is an alliance of the non-college educated groups like the army, businessmen, and religious interests who also push those groups' interests. It's worth pointing out here that people take out student loans for trade schools as well. And these loans are eligible for forgiveness under the terms of Biden's plan should that plan survive its challenges in court. 
Trade school programs are usually considerably less expensive than college education and therefore easier to pay off. However, they are still much more expensive than most individuals can afford without a loan. Put another way, what if Altist has a very limited perspective on who might benefit from what programs? And perhaps his description of these sides, their aims and goals should be more carefully nuanced and considered. Additionally, his description of who has a college education is just flat out wrong. Senior non-commissioned officers in the American military are encouraged to seek associate's or bachelor's degrees in order to have an opportunity to be promoted. All officers in the military have a bachelor's and advancement requires continuing education into a master's degree. Advancement in most major corporations is significantly easier with a bachelor's degree and a business degree makes it easier still. Additionally, the groups being described are not monolithically aligned with any one political party. These generalizations undercut this analysis. To be clear, these are popular perceptions and reliable tropes that we can be depended upon to know. But I have just described how elements of the military who design and implement policy, and how those in business who do the same, do not fit into the box in which they have been placed by what if altist. Understanding that these basic assumptions are flawed, and how these flaws have appeared, will serve us well as we move on throughout this video. In civil wars in which a nation has a professional, good quality military, the side that the army goes with will predict who will win the civil war with frightening accuracy. This is because the difference between trained and untrained soldiers in combat is so massive that if one side can train its soldiers, it cannot lose. The Russian and French revolutions only worked since the army refused to follow the orders to shoot the rebels and instead sided with the rebels. Alternately, look at the Spanish Civil War where the left-wing nationals controlled almost all of Spain, but then the North African-based fascist army was able to almost single-handedly win the Civil War against them from carving across the country. The U.S. military has historically always tilted right. There aren't good statistics for the last 10 years, but I see very little evidence that things would change. It hasn't been a completely massive tilt historically, but something to consider is that as the left grows more radical, it becomes more anti-military and against the values that hold the military together, like honor, discipline, and duty. Meanwhile, the right as it becomes more radical becomes more markedly militaristic and pro-military. Thus, in a process of radicalization, as will almost certainly happen, we would expect the army to fall into a more right-wing sphere. Officers or those who provide leadership and make the decisions for what political side their units would choose tilt significantly more conservative as well, more so than the rest of the military. I'll grant you that the more well-trained and technologically advanced military will most likely be successful in a tactical situation. However, these examples of the French and Russian revolutions are nonsense. These are complex events in which the militaries of various nations played different roles at different times. The French Revolution took place over a period of 10 years and involved quite a few wars which occupied the French army. However, at many key events, the French army, both royalist and revolutionary, did fire on the crowd. Military units on both sides took part in the 14 July 1789 storming of the Bastille. Revolutionary guards fired on Jacobin protesters who were demanding the execution of the king following his escape attempt in, to the Netherlands in 1791. The Russian Revolution, or more properly, revolutions, were an even more complex example. The Russian Empire had come close to revolution in 1905 as it suffered a series of embarrassing defeats to the army and navy of Japan. Ultimately, the promise of reform was dangled before some of Russia's more liberal politicians by Tsar Nicholas II. However, by 1917, Russia had again suffered numerous military disasters in the First World War. Along with this, there was rampant poverty and widespread hunger. In what is known as the February Revolution, which took place in March, Russia had some long-standing calendar shenanigans due to its use of the Julian calendar. A massive protest of women formed to demand bread. These strikes quickly spread to the rest of Petrograd. The Tsar was unable to rally elements of the army in Petrograd, which had soon started executing their own officers, and this had prompted Nicholas to attempt to return to the capital. Along the way, Nicholas was stopped by a coalition of businessmen, politicians, and army officers who convinced him to abdicate. The Duma, originally formed as a concession back in 1905 and never granted any real power, formed a provisional government under Alexander Kerensky while various worker collectives and enlisted soldiers formed in the communes called Soviets, particularly in the cities of Petrograd and Moscow. The Soviets have a variety of figures of note, 
but the most notable for our purposes is one Leon Trotsky. A tenuous balance between the provisional government and the Soviets formed in the aftermath of this event. Into this situation, the Germans decided to send Lenin from exile in Switzerland to Russia. The provisional government had attempted to keep Russia in the war, and the Germans very much wished them to stop. Russia's continued participation in World War I had been costly militarily and economically. The provisional government's efforts to keep Russia in the war provided Lenin with an opening to increase the popularity of his Bolshevik faction. Lenin's slogan of peace, land, and bread caught on and convinced a great many to back him and the Bolsheviks, including Trotsky. In response to the rising power of the Bolsheviks, Kerensky cracked down on them, arresting Trotsky and others and driving Lenin into exile in Finland. Kerensky then appointed General Ovar Kornilov to be supreme commander of Russia's armed forces. Kornilov began organizing his forces to march on Petrograd in August of 1917. This caused Kerensky no end of consternation. He turned around, released Trotsky, and gave him leave to organize a defense of the city. In addition, Kerensky armed Trotsky and the Bolsheviks. Fortunately for Kornilov, Trotsky never had to engage him in combat. The workers under Trotsky engaged in a masterful campaign of sabotage of the rail lines and telegraph systems, which ultimately caused Kornilov's coup to simply fail by disrupting the ground lines of communication. The victorious Bolsheviks, along with the returned Lenin, stormed the palace in 1917 and took Petrograd without any serious resistance. Shortly thereafter, the Russian Civil War began, which involved military units from both sides. This characterization of the Spanish Civil War is also lacking. The assertion that the Nationalist Army was able to almost single-handedly win the war against the Republicans leaves out a number of important steps. The war took three years. The Nationalists received extensive support from Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Portugal. The Republicans received support from the Soviet Union and Mexico. The military was divided between the Nationalists and Republicans, and the fighting was long and bitter. Setting aside the gross historical simplifications, we come to another assertion as to the United States military tilting right. This assertion is kind of a mixed bag. It's certainly a popular opinion, and one that Republicans and alt-right agents provocateurs love repeating. Efforts have been made to investigate the proportion of veterans who identify with each party. The website, thesoldierproject.org, takes four of these recent efforts from 2009, 2015, 2018, and 2020 and gives short summaries of them. In this period of 11 years, the answer seems to vary wildly, and in fairness, they may have seen some pretty substantial shifts. It's difficult to say with any accuracy because each of the sources use different methodologies and at different times where the military is experiencing rapidly different situations. Ultimately, the site, the article, and the general observations posited by members of the online military community suggest that the Air Force and the Marines tend to skew very conservative while the Navy and the Army are significantly less so. What if Altis goes on to assert that the Army would fall into a right-wing orbit in the event of radicalization? I'm not sure that this is an assertion you can make, particularly given that you're not correct in the original assertion that the military is overwhelmingly right wing. Allow me to provide some personal insight here. When I was not much younger than what if altist, I was a cadet in my college's Army ROTC battalion. The process of medical reviews revealed a chronic illness which I would ultimately be unable to obtain a waiver for, and this prevented my serving in the military, but I participated for several years prior to this ultimate determination. In the first semester of a cadet's first year, you will be taught various customs, courtesies, and cultural values of the Army. This is done because cadets wear a uniform and are expected to comport themselves in accordance with the standards this entails. Among those standards is the expectation that cadets and soldiers do not use the uniform or perceived moral authority of the military to further political agendas. The United States military is supposed to be apolitical. It should take no sides and heavily resist being placed in a role to become kingmakers in our democracy. Candidates for office may refer to their service in bids to be elected, but the military does not formally endorse these candidates. In addition, active duty military can only be used on U.S. soil in specific circumstances. The National Guards of various states are bound by a different set of laws. 
If a party, whether inside the military or outside of it, is perceived as trying to politicize the military, then condemnation often swiftly follows. Trump was the subject of open letters from retired military leaders condemning his actions and stances towards the military on occasion. General Mark Milley wore his uniform to a political function while accompanying the president during the 2020 BLM protests. This earned him some raised eyebrows. However, in a later article, linked below, he expressed regret at this action and spent the remainder of the Trump presidency working to preserve the boundaries between the presidency and the military. I'd also point out that the chart displayed near the end while suggesting that officers tilt conservative has Joe Biden beating Trump in 2020 in a fairly sizable third party vote in 2016, which cast doubt on the assertion in question. Perhaps what if all this requires a better editorial process so as not to include visuals that directly contradict his text. I'd like to take this opportunity to point out that at no point has there been any in-depth examination done on the first American Civil War. This is curious. Generally, college coursework breaks American history into two semesters, the first semester covering up to or including the Civil War, and the second semester covering the Civil War or after it, as the case may be. This split is because the period of the American Civil War is incredibly important to American history. The social and political aspects that are in play prior to the war help explain how a geographically coherent confederacy can exist in the first place. Additionally, the whole tenor of American society has changed in the aftermath of the war. Understanding this has makes understanding why a recurrence of the Civil War is much less likely to happen. In the second part of this video, we will talk about how the American Civil War came to happen in the first place. This will let us take a look at what conditions exist today and how they might be the same or different and lead into any kind of additional conflict for the United States. However, at this point, we will continue on with this video. Likewise, ethnic minorities tend to side with the left since they're scared of the dominant culture, which tends to be encapsulated by the right and often do the social agendas pushed by the left, such as homosexuality, abortion, or transsexuality as abominations. Here we have some more delightful essentialism by what a fault is. He asserts people of color side for the left because they're afraid of the dominant culture of conservatism. There might be some truth to this. People of color are perceived as voting for Democrats. This can be true, but there is a considerable amount of overlap between the professed values of the right wing and people of color. Very often, there are significant conservative values in play in communities of color. Christianity is a very popular religion among people of color. It's also a very popular religion among conservative communities. That minorities vote for Democrats is not due to conservative dominance or any fear, but due to the racist hostility which is routinely displayed by major right-wing figures and parties. What if Altis loves maps? He likes to make them. Sadly for him, he is bad at this. The second factor being control of resources, notably the necessary ones like food, energy, and the like. In short terms, if a side can control these, it can just shut off the power and food to starve out its opponents, destroying even the ability to stand up straight, let alone wage war. Here the right has a very strong advantage. When you strip away all factors, the political division in America is that between city and countryside, and the countryside produces literally everything the cities consume, whether food, oil, electricity, in many cases water and the like. Since all rural areas in America are conservative, it's incredibly easy to see them just surround and blockade cities, cutting them off from any resources. Even on a broader geographic level, the conservative states are a giant central block while the blue states are on either side of the continent. The blue bubbles in between like Chicago, Minneapolis, New Mexico, or Colorado are surrounded on all sides by hundreds of miles of red territory that would almost certainly immediately consume them. So here we have a map. This map purports to display the political leanings of counties. It may even correctly display some set of election results. However, whether this map correctly displays the election results is irrelevant. What if Altish tries to use this map to speculate on how a conflict might play out between his fantasy of the right wing and his fantasy of the left wing? This map is not a collection of military dispositions. It's at most election results. Maps are created for a purpose. What information is displayed on a map, indeed even how that map is drawn, will be affected by its purpose. 
If you attempt to use a map for something other than its intended purpose, you will draw the wrong conclusions or have the wrong directions. What if Alt Hist imagines a great red wave, which crashes upon and consumes these tiny islands of blue? There are no principles of war being examined here because this map doesn't display military information. Because a map doesn't display military information, any military conclusions drawn from it are going to not necessarily be accurate. Our election results are the results of elections between two parties, one displayed in red and one displayed in blue. This creates an illusion for some that the map is controlled in a given area by the red party or the blue party. Let's take a look at this other map, however. See all that purple? Conservatives and liberals live side by side. The nature for the election is that winner takes all, so that one area will look to be controlled by a particular group. But this is not the case. Red areas are won by conservative politicians and blue areas are won by liberal politicians. But in each, there exists liberals and conservatives living by each other side by side. To argue that one party controls a given area because they have won elections there is to ignore that people live in those areas do not win in the elections. Their candidates don't get voted in. It would be a mistake to assume that there is a one-to-one -one ratio between control of an election and a military control of an area in a state where violence has broken out. For my second point, let me present two things. The first is a map of population density in North America. The second is a view from space of North America at night. Seal those concentrations of light. The biggest ones correspond to cities and suburbs which happen to correspond to the blue areas of what a fault is this map. Very few people live in the great swaths of red that he has painted. Per the Census Bureau, some 80% of the American population lives in urban centers, largely concentrated on the coasts. This overwhelming rural majority, which apparently controls everything of value in what a faultist world, simply does not exist. Long and the short of it is, this map is nonsense. Meanwhile, fascist Japan or Germany did not purge their own populations. Promptly after being given power in 1934, Hitler, Goring, and Himmler orchestrated a purge of the Nazi party, which, among others, Ernst Röhm and the stormtroopers were killed. This was called the Night of the Long Knives, and it's just one of many examples of right-wingers killing their own. This has only been a small section of the video in question. Debunking even a few minutes of what if autists work has already created a video with a runtime exceeding the original video. We have taken only a cursory look at the history he invokes and seen that the stories are often much more complicated. This isn't nuance, it's a fantasy. And all that would be fine if this was an alternate history or speculative fiction. But what if Altist wants us to take him seriously as an analyst? Part of the mission of two guys talking history is to demonstrate good process and push back against bad. This is an example of the bad. So I want you to please join me in the next installment of this video essay, where we examine the situation leading up to the American Civil War and look at the circumstances surrounding contemporary political violence and attempt to come up with a more coherent answer to this question. Finally, I want to thank you for your time. Please consider supporting our work by liking this video and subscribing.